Uh, okay, now the idea <coughs> of um, the symbolic bird first surfaced many years ago in your PhD. Had you seen that expression before, or was it an expression you invented? <coughs> no, uh, I hadn't. But um, I've been working a lot with um, Pierre Bourdieu's work on symbolic capital. And I've been teaching that for many years and uh, I've been familiar with his works uh, since the mid-80s. But um, since I was researching uh, social work within child protection services, uh, as you know, I did um, uh, use a lot of the ideas from Bourdieu in order to try to find out what kind of capital they had access to among the clients. And um, we had uh, worked for many years to see how the, uh, the use and the, yeah, the, the interface between services and, and, the, and the public had expanded enormously. So we had, um, we had uh, graphs going uh, exponentially up from the mid 80s to, uh, uh, and they're still growing at the rate of about 4% a year. Uh, but what has been increasing is the, the reporting and uh, uh, the uh, assessment of children. But uh, what we had seen over many years was that the rate of children that were removed from the homes uh, did not increase at all. Uh, when child protection expanded, especially during the 80s and 90s, um, there was this scare that um, there was a lot of children who suffered from abuse and neglect and uh, we just didn't see them. So if we had better systems to... Can we just take a pause here? Huh? You're saying... You're suggesting that the numbers of children placed yeah. remained more or less flat. Yeah. Um, just to check the, the words that were being used to describe these children, uh, they were actually called, this was called the Child Protection Program, and it referred only to children who were placed in care. No, it referred to all children that were referred to the Child Protection Services, and they used only two concepts. That was children being placed and children being assisted with their parents. Right. And a lot of them were with single mothers. Right. But um, <coughs> the expansion of uh, reporting uh, did not affect the amount of children in the population that were placed. So it seemed that uh, the, the expansion of social work with th these families uh, had some other explanation rather than that we now would see all those kids that were in need or should have been saved. So the, the language and the, and the problems that we were facing were not corresponding with our data. And uh, the most used uh, explanation in statistics were other. That explained uh, more than 30% of both why they became clients and what uh, they did with them. So the, the data and the concepts that we're using, the variables we registered, they didn't explain what was going on. So uh, my work tried to sort of deconstruct the everyday life of these families that we were working with. And I was, uh, since much research was concerned. So he was American and very familiar with the English language. And uh, I tried to see what kind of words that he would like <laughs> if I tried to find something that I could describe to name this form of capital that was negative. And I tried to, to say to Jim that what if I use the notion of symbolic burdens 
and he knew what I was working with and he knew some of my empirical data. So he said, I think you should elaborate on that and, and start using it, but you have to find a way of explaining what it is. So <clears throat> um, what I did was to uh, sort out my empirical data in such a way that I could illustrate and uh, give objective examples of this kind of burdens. And uh, you can even see it on, this, uh, on the forms that were used by the state when people were, had to fill out stuff. They, the state is always asking for certain categories which is important in the society. For example, are you married or not? Uh, if you're divorced and uh, so on. And are you single? Are yeah. you a widower or whatever? Yeah. Just interrupt here to and say that we would. Uh, this form of categorization in itself is interesting, that in a sense, categorization is driven actually at its roots are some form of ideology. Yeah. That in a sense, the it's what you might call textually organized practice that you, yeah. you guide people to be concerned only with certain things and value certain things rather yeah. than others yeah. yeah and if you look at this uh, categorizations and then the scales you are using for example about education there's always a scale from having none education to being a, a doctor or a professor and uh, if you look at for example income you can have very little income and you can have a lot of income and uh, if you look at health you can have very good health or you can have all kinds of problems with your health which a lot of these people have and uh, good health would be a symbolic capital while bad health and chronic diseases or bad gene boom or whatever might hit the family it's a symbolic burden because nobody wants to join in and share those things uh, a notion of symbolic burdens is also that these things you don't talk about so when we ask kids later in in a survey you know, 14 to 16 year olds they um, the kids who had parents with higher education, they knew what kind of education their parents had, but the other ones had to go home and ask, because education was not a thing. You mean it hadn't been talked about at home? No, it hadn't been talked about. It wasn't anything they were speaking about. So uh, then they could come back and say, oh, my father only has uh, nine years or seven years of schooling, and uh, then he dropped out of secondary school. I didn't know that before. Mm. Now he's working with this and that. And uh, so, and also if you fill out a form, uh, these things have a tendency to be rated in some way, in already in that form. For example, uh, if you should cross out that you don't have any education, you very often end up being on the bottom of a scale. And the scale doesn't present itself um, as other than it's one end of a, of a range. And nobody has said that this is negative. But you know that you're supposed to have more education today. Education is one of the assets people should have access to. And uh, all those who are not doing them good in school, they are losing out. So there is no doubt that you have a scale here which is rated from symbolic capital to symbolic burdens. If you're writing your CV, for example, uh, those are the things you don't want to talk about or be asked about. So symbolic burdens are those things that you are not necessarily interested in presenting about yourself. And here comes the sort of neoliberal or late modern idea about the self becoming uh, uh, commodified in a market and these are the things that are objectified and commodified 
within the notion of self. So uh, these people have a sort of a personal presentation or self-presentation which might end up in many ways in such a way that they would be poor, referred to uh, the accumulation they have of resources or access to resources. So they are poor in a modern sense. You introduced a new word here, Edgar, yeah. resources. Yeah. Yeah, that's something I've been uh, filling out this uh, idea of uh, symbolic burdens with later, because we tend to uh, focus on needs uh, in social work. And uh, what I've seen is that a lot of the things they're working with now is access to resources within a modern society. And uh, if they don't uh, have access to these resources, they are in fact acting within a form of poverty. So, by using the notion of resources or symbolic burdens or capital rather than needs, because needs is a more basic uh, notion. It's like food, it's like housing, and it's like. Uh, it needs blood, material. Whatever. Yeah, it, it also contains all those things that you need in order to survive, like uh, uh, caring and. Mm. love and so on. So you're making a mm. distinction here between uh, trying to work out somebody's needs mm. and somebody's access to resources. Yeah, because if you separate those, it becomes very obvious that much of this concern about children is not about their needs, it's about their access to resources. That their parents don't have the access to the necessary symbolic capital, either socially, culturally, or economically. And uh, the idea is that you should invest in these children in order to invest in society in such a way that if they have parents that have a lack of resources or an accumulation of symbolic burdens, the, the kids should grow up and society should be building up the resources that the parents lack. So the idea behind this new way of child protection uh, seems to be an investment in society. Uh, but it doesn't seem to work that way because if we look at those who have been clients within social services and child protection, there is nothing that child protection has done which compensates for this uh, lack of resources. Very often we see that these children are not stupid, but they don't do good well in school and they don't go to further education because they haven't learned anything about that education should be something that you are trying to reach for. It's not uh, value within the family or um, in that social field where you operate and um, they don't see any need for for putting a lot of effort into study. This is, this is not the general um, uh, conclusion but it explains some of the facts that uh, children from upper class families and, and middle class families to a much larger degree uh, reach for education if their parents are well educated. So that, that's common in all Western countries. So you're saying that it's not as simple as lack of access to resources, but the, shall we say, um, the knowledge and competence yeah. to seek resources as well. Uh, so yeah. it's not as simple as saying, I mean, for example, if we if we wanted to um, to go out and buy a beer, yeah. we might have 
a desire to have a beer, yeah. but we would have to have two things. Yeah. One is the knowledge of where to go. Yeah. Secondly, very often, what kind of beer we want. Yeah. And then thirdly, something to pay for it. Yeah. Or at least a friend will pay for it. Yeah. So if you buy the expensive beer, you, you have to uh, accept that this is more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which is not necessarily the case always, but <laughs> it tends to be a market which regulates this. Right. Um, but uh, if you look at uh, the children uh, in this uh, sense and the families, uh, I think that uh, uh, this is where we come back to taste and uh, and. Uh, the social practices related to that. I can remember a mother, she was so proud uh, on her mantelpiece uh, at home, she had a picture of her daughter with a degree from secondary school. And uh, when I grew up, there was like 10% of the uh, youngsters that took secondary school to prepare for university. And these exams, they would give you a student cap, which was black at that time. So the parents could have a picture of the, their upcoming university student uh, with a black cap, which would allow you into university. But these, this daughter had a red cap because she had been going to the, a regular secondary school, which everybody had. Now, because the schooling was expanded to 12 years in the mid-90s. But she didn't connect to this change of schooling and, and that everybody should go to school for 12 years. And her daughter had made this and she had made okay grades and so on. But this was not a symbolic capital anymore because it, it had become an inflationary education in that sense, Bourdieu sense, because now everybody should have it and had access to it. Can you go a bit over that again? When you yeah. say inflationary, you mean the transition from whatever number of yeah, years? Yeah, from 9 to 12 years. What, how did, what, what did became, this mean? That became uh, normal in the mid-90s. We had a school reform because we had growing uh, young people's uh, unemployment among youngsters and one way of getting rid of that was to have them in school longer and they also were thinking that we are moving towards the knowledge society so we have to have more people going along to school so it was a combination of unemployed kids and investment in society so this was a very uh, costly reform to have all the kids in school for much longer and they all, of course then you, your parents had to feed you more years instead of nine or to ten they had to feed you for twelve years because you were going to school longer <laughs> and uh, this was an investment both in society and in families but it was common everybody got access to this but when something that was only one out of ten earlier, then it was a, a, an achievement and it was not something that everybody did. So earlier uh, this was a symbolic uh, capital in that sense that it was acknowledged as something special. But uh, when you normalize it, uh, it's, this value uh, is... In, in this value is degraded. It's degraded. By yeah. this inflation. Right. So it's not worth it anymore. Uh, Bourdieu uses, for example, the, in classical music, if everybody starts listening to Vivaldi, uh, those people with class would have to listen to something else, which is not so common. Because Vivaldi will be for example, degraded. And the Reiki, which is not uh, very well known. Mm. So you, it, it's, uh, you see this movement from everybody's uh, resource to something that is special. It's become very important 
within the market. So you can see it within the, uh, the fashions uh, among kids, for example. You can, that was a very good example with the, the skaters and the snowboarders. Uh, they suddenly came with clothes that nobody else had. And uh, it was their clothes. And you had to be a sagger or whatever in order to be in the right um, field uh, within this taste area. So it was a very costly and, and um, attractive capital for some youngsters. And um, the way of seeking uniqueness has become a very important market edge. And the same thing happens with all those other things that we dress ourselves with. So you're supposed to be some kind of special. But uh, uh, in order to be special now within education, you, you have to go much longer than secondary school. Now you have to be among those who do their BAs and Masters and PhDs and so on. So the, the price of uh, the symbolic capital has increased. It requires a much heavier investment in order to be on top than it was earlier. And this is very much the same within the rest of society. And if you look at this wide range of, of access to symbolic capital, you see that once you start moving down the, the scale, you end up in some areas of the scale where it's nothing to talk about anymore. And that's when you move into the symbolic burdens. Because if you compare yourself to others, you don't like to speak about those things, but because you don't have anything to brag about. You can listen to old mothers. Um, they speak about all the things that their children have sort of accomplished in life. But then there is one woman which is very quiet because her son is in prison. It's nothing to talk about. Mm. So um, uh, it has to be uh, upscale in order to be symbolic capital. I think that Bourdieu didn't uh, fetch this uh, commodification of capital enough in his conceptualization. Because he was too much concerned about the class in a, in a more classical sense. Mm. Uh, he was looking at farmers versus the universe educated various people and so on. And um, they could never become the same. So he was himself an example of that. He was from Bern in southern France, the son of a postmaster. And he took, uh, became one of the most prestigious uh, academics in France. But he never changed his dialect. So he kept this uh, sign of being a peasant son almost. In order to demonstrate that uh, he was not willing to sacrifice his identity for mm. becoming an upper class. Mm. And you can see this is uh, quite common. Well, it, in a way, it's interesting to reflect. That is many people's interpretations of the those who voted to leave oh. the European Union oh. in this country were less well educated. Oh. And um, as a major factor in trying to understand that, that um, they couldn't, therefore their identity, oh. a secure one was really a secure working class identity, whereas people with an education would regard themselves as Europeans oh. rather than a version of uh, of what is, is is commonly called British, whatever. Yeah, that it can also, I think, be read as a revolt against the establishment. Yeah. Oh, that was the, the other establishment. Fact. Yeah. Uh, in Britain and in many other countries, they haven't suffered anything from the bank crisis, yeah. uh, the yeah. setback, the immigration, yeah. whatever. They have always just keep making money. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's 
a demonstration of political power, I think. Yeah. Can we come back to the this question of... Um, well, there are two issues around lack of resources oh. that you've raised over yeah. the last two days yeah. with me. Uh, I'd like you to expand a bit on them. The first is uh, connected with the lack of resources becoming interpreted as risk. And in that context, of course, you referred to Breach Featherston and Kate Morris's recently published paper on feeding the, uh, the risk monster. Yeah. Um, and our conversation we had about a nice title for the work that I do would be yeah. to either putting the risk monster on a diet yeah. or, or, or killing it in effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, you made that connection then between the lack of resources and the risk yeah. monster. Yeah, yeah that's because um, I think a lot of the discussion about risk uh, is linked to this idea of uh, symbolic burdens. It's not really a risk of suffering uh, because of lack of food, housing, whatever. Or a cr yeah. criminal injury. Yeah. yeah. So it's not any serious stuff, really. A lot of the risks are related to the children are not given the space of possibility for expanding their, uh, the value of themselves. Uh, during their childhood. So we have seen a lot of, of uh, childcare actions that are, for example, to give children a weekend home in a more resourceful family in order to uh, get the inspiration and uh, experience of, of being so poor. That doesn't solve the problem of poverty for the mother or that family, but uh, uh, I think it to some extent also might make this kid ashamed because he's seeing the contrast and he can't speak about how we have things at home because uh, he's comparing his own life and everyday situation to the situation of this more well-off family. So we have seen that many times uh, children become ill in such placements and they have stomach aches they are they don't want to go, to go there and um, they um, uh, they, it becomes a problem that every time they've been there they're sick hmm. so uh, I know one of those cases where uh, we solved it by discussing this with the boy and he said um, Every time I come to this weekend home, uh, the boy in the home shows me every, all the new stuff he's got, games and toys and whatever and stuff he's in. So in his room, so he wants to show me all this new stuff he's got the last month. And uh, uh, it makes my stomach ache because uh, I don't have anything to show him. I can't bring anything to, to those visits, uh, which is new because we don't, can't afford it. So it became a, a problem that they had established this weekend. They had never thought about this kind of uh, comparison that would um, be a normal thing among children. So, so, this so that was not the kind of friends he had. Yeah. Well, not only that, but of course, this isn't, was not something that he would, as you said, people don't want to talk about their symbolic burdens. He wouldn't yeah. want to talk about what he had. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good example. Right. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Because he would be ashamed. Yeah. Right? So that's why I made a list of those things that uh, connect with uh, symbolic burdens. I'll see if I find it. Can you pick your laptop up? Yeah.
Yes, um, uh, I was talking about uh, the market for symbolic burdens. Uh, market in the sense that if you present these things, they are given a certain value. But this, since these values are negative, uh, you are losing your face in the sense that. Uh, you have made a presentation or you want to have an attitude that people should have about you which you have to reveal uh, it's not true or the true face is shown to some sense and that leads you to shame humiliation guilt and dishonor uh, rather than uh, things that are related to uh, honor and, uh, and pride and respect so it's the opposite use of concepts related to self which people don't usually want to reveal that's why symbolic burdens is such a psychologically focused problem really you, s you touched earlier on the yeah so in fact that was you what you mentioned to me earlier was that the psychological focus is in fact not appropriate or is somehow misleading or is somehow that's what caused something caused you to shift from the idea of burden to resource yeah because um, uh, the idea of uh, needs uh, is relating to people need to survive and need to thrive and grow and things like that is related to the physical and the psychological body but um, getting access to resources is a social all, activity yeah it's a social activity which uh, allows you to accumulate and uh, social life is rule bound so you've got to know the rules uh, uh, so, so uh, you don't really need them you survive very well without and much of the symbolic resources we uh, have around us today didn't exist 50 or 60 years ago uh, it's, it's a, and in addition it has become uh, commodified because you can always put a price on it very often you can claim higher wages um, you can uh, be more expensive uh, whatever uh, if you have access to to these um, resources and it's it's also reflected in in how things are paid in society so it is in, in, a, in the end it ends up becoming economic capital so the access to uh, symbolic capital in the cultural and, and the social sense it's very often also uh, among those things that it gives you access to to uh, capital in, in the classical sense hmm. can we so that's um so you're saying risk i mean we come back just come back briefly to risk yeah. uh obviously um Hitherto, I mean, thinking about you know things that I've worked on with colleagues for years now, yeah. uh, that that we saw risk as being the, the major issue in all yeah. of this, and what has always puzzled us, yeah. obviously, is the fact that um, you know we have this flat line in harm and injury, and yeah. no matter where we go, whether yeah. it's Norway, whether yeah. it's Australia, yeah. whether it's all the UK local authorities yeah. we work in whether it's uh, Donegal in the Republic of Ireland, um, 
and all the rest is what so all the rest is usually interpreted as risk so you get various mechanisms emerging for trying to calculate this yeah. not I'm not saying not in the calculation in the yeah. mathematical sense yeah. but in the moral sense yeah. and a moral sense too which is suggestive that people should be doing these things yeah. to avoid risk yeah uh, one of the major risks growing up today is not going to school yeah and that's not a need. No. That's what a perfect example of, of something that's symbolic. Yeah. Right. So you would then deconstruct some of these attempts to um, predict, shall we say, these quasi-predictive instruments, because they're not mathematical. Um, mm. You would, inter you, would, you, you would attempt to interpret them by saying, what is it that they're drawing attention to in this family? Um, yeah, they're, they're drawing attention to a lot of stuff that might affect uh, the ability to make money when you become an adult. Yeah, right, okay, so, it's as crude as that. Yeah. yeah. As simple as that. Yeah, yeah that's... Uh, yeah. So the risk is not uh, that you're going to be harmed or injured, the risk is that as an adult... Yeah. You won't be either not be making money and paying taxes, or you will not make enough to be a good consumer. And that is what a good person is, a good consumer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah everything today is about uh, being able to consume. Right. The other expression that you've used, because um, I think, you know, oh. the risk monster I think the, the idea of calling risk a monster is a very, I think, a very good one. Yeah. Um, and, um, but the other notion you used, and this is a Bodhya, yeah. a Bodhya word yeah. Yeah, from the French, senior, yeah. sign. What, in what sense would you interpret in English the French expression senior? Uh, I would say that these uh, symbolic burdens, they become signs in the sense that they communicate uh, something which is not in your favor. And they are dysphemisms, many of those concepts, because they, they awake feelings of shame, guilt, and so on. And um, uh, instead of euphemisms, as we very often tend to tend to be more attractive. So uh, those signs have the rhetorical ability of communicating negative capital. So symbolic burdens becomes a sign of poverty very often, or the kind of lives that is not very attractive. So. Concepts like losers and so on is things that become attached to you as a person. And this is signifying um, a large part of these uh, people who have this kind of... of uh, but I think that it's important to, to uh, for, uh, say that the way I'm speaking now is a way of communicating based on dominant view uh, among the elites or whatever and uh, it, the good thing about a symbolic burden is that it doesn't necessarily have to ruin your life because if you are living with people who are loving and caring and you're surviving in a, and you're having most of the time and your life is okay but it's just that when you compare with norms of being better, you become a loser. So that's why I think that you have to regard a lot of these ideas about symbolic burdens, that they might, within the field where you operate, with your uh, um, encompassed group, that you have a you are encompassed by a group uh, which might be similar to you and all the co in all comparisons with those who are similar to you 
you come out as someone like the other. So it's when you compare these poor people to the rich or the middle class that the difference becomes visible. Right. It's a comparison. Yeah, that's the and thing. this is what happens within child protection. Right. Now, so these differences are explained as risks. Right. Now, no, these differences are explained as risks, but these differences are also explained as signs. Yeah, they are signs, but in a sense, they, when they are communicated by a, a group which is dominant within communication in society, for example, you represent the state or the municipality, and uh, you put a claim on people that they are not good enough by using these concepts uh, on themselves. So you sort of, this is a culture of blaming. It becomes a culture of blaming. But you're defenseless because this is your life. It's the way your life has been. So you sort of blame because it ended up like this. So. I think that social workers should be much more sensitive and uh, in my teaching I try to use this uh, concepts uh, of uh, capital and so on uh, in such a sense that uh, you should always be looking for what are the values within the field you're entering. This was also Bourdieu's uh, uh, idea of exploring the capital within the field, not imposing your idea of symbolic capital on others uh, which didn't have the same possibilities or the same resources. So I think that uh, in a sense this could be used in social work to pay more respect to lives that are different instead of blaming people unconsciously. That's what you do with the risk discourse. So that's interesting. So in fact, what the risk dis discourse does, because it's not calculable, and we no. know that, no. uh, and yet the word is used constantly. No. No. Um, and um, the word sign is used because very often uh, signs are seen as indicators of risk, and no. even if they're not calculable, there, it's assumed that, that somehow or other, yeah. if you use this word sign, yeah. it's a sign of, yeah. uh, then uh, in fact you are yeah. um, uh, underpinning that assumption. Yeah. Is this this kind of idea of poor access to resources yeah. somehow yeah. becomes a sign of mm. of risk? Hmm? Yeah, we try to uh, see how children's lives corresponded to their parents' lives in our research on, on uh, children and families, uh, where we had a thousand families from Norway and Sweden. And uh, uh, we had a, a lot of variables we measured both socially, with health, education, uh, access to resources and so on. And we could uh, for example, rate parents uh, according to access to resources in all these fields. And uh, we created a stress factor um, based on uh, high scores on, uh, on uh, a lot of these factors, which was negative. And uh, we also used uh, measurements from stress, resource, uh, stress research, which is very common. To apply in this kind of surveys. And then we compared the same measures that were relevant to children on health and performance and uh, the social uh, functioning and so on. And because the notion of children suffering because the parents are uh, sort of contaminated with all these problems. The hypothesis was that, that then these children must also have the same signs. There was no statistical uh, uh, connection at all between the children that had problems and the parents. In fact, 
it was the the middle class parents that had the kids that had most severe problems, measured on psychological and social scales and so on. And not, the working class kids were very well functioning, even on the school level. So the reason the social workers had started working with these families was the accumulation of symbolic burdens among their parents. This is a sample of about a thousand. Yeah. And how, what was the sampling frame? Where, where did they come from? They fit from they came, they, it was a representative sample of all the clients in the services. Right, so they were in so, they were in Berlin, Berlin, they were came. Yeah, and this was later. This was later when I checked by all the data we have in Norway and, hmm. and the Bureau of Statistics, and they confirmed the findings. Hmm. Okay. All the variables that yeah. they were able to reproduce. Yeah. We've been talking now for uh, 40 minutes, yeah. at least, probably a bit longer. Um, I think what you've done here is clarify some important issues arising yeah. out of, um, of uh, your original use of um, yeah. a symbolic burden yeah. with uh, using Bourdieu, but also I think going on from that, using empirical data from yeah families and children in, the, in child welfare services or rather as you rename them child yeah. protection because yeah. there's a, obviously an issue around what a service is called yeah. uh, but um, and connecting this up with the idea of risk yeah. with signs and uh, above all um, the, the question of resources yeah. uh, so is, is there any, anything you would want to Add to my summary there of saying, well, you know, I'm not saying you should say uh, you don't understand it, but um, am I making the right connections? Yeah, I think you are. But uh, I think one of the important things here is that uh, I think that our findings between the parents and the children uh, is a confirmation of the, how the risk discourse is missing something. Yeah. Uh, because that's not the way the kids see it. No, uh, the children probably have a quite different idea of uh, their lives than, than the social workers. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Edgar.